Good morning. Good morning. The church is God's appointed agency for the salvation of men. It was organized for service and its mission is to carry the gospel to the world. You guys are learning it very good. I was going to say, does, anyone, does, that, does that sound familiar? That was part of last week's homework. Of course, it continues a little bit with, with one more sentence, but the main reason I want us to memorize and to learn that is to, for it to be fresh in our minds. What our mission? The church is God's agency for the salvation of men. It is our duty as a church, <clears throat> excuse me, to work together. As we saw last Sabbath, the great commission, my commission, and commission means working together. It is not the duty of one, but the duty of all of us collaborating together. Amen? Amen. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, I just ask that you open our minds and fill us with your Holy Spirit and remove any distractions this morning. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 How many of you have ever been or maybe heard a symphony and the ending was cut short and you're left, where's the ending? You know, I don't know if, uh, if you like to listen to classical music, um, but I was listening to 101.1 this past week and uh, there is a piece by Joseph Haydn a classical piece that was written for a strings quartet and it can be arranged for any other uh, uh, string instruments but it's entitled The Joke and you kind of get it as you're hearing it because when you think it's going to end it's climaxing right to the end dun, 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 and they kind of stop and you're like oh and then, then they, and then they continue again and then they stop and then they continue again and you're kind of thrown off balance like whoa is it going to stop is it going to go and then when you think that, that they're going to keep going, thun, 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 and I mean, they just cut it and stop, and that's the end. And you're left, at, at least I am, I'm left hanging thinking, that's not an ending. <laughs> you know, you're, you're expecting to hear, you know, how, how it climaxes, thun, 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 thun. And if, if they don't give you that ending, you know, you, you almost may do it yourself in the car or wherever it is you're listening to it. And I, just, I would like to invite you to open your Bibles because something is similar in the book of Mark. In the book of Mark, is there is something similar with, with, with this gospel that I've entitled The Unfinished Commission. Mark chapter 16. Mark chapter 16, we're going to begin with verse 1. It says, Now when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of Jesus, and Salome brought spices that they might come and anoint him every, very early in the morning on the first day of the week. They came to the tomb when the sun had risen, and they s said among themselves, Who will roll away the stone from the door of the tomb for us? But when they looked, they saw that the stone had been rolled away, for it was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man clothed in a long white robe, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See? the place where they laid him. But go and tell the disciples and Peter that he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him as he said to you. Verse 8, And they went out quickly and fled from the tomb, for they trembled and were amazed. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were what? For they were afraid. And then it continues from verses 9 through verse 20. Does anyone here have a version of the Bible that verses 9 through 20 is not there? 
Everyone has verses 9 through 20? You may notice that, that there may be, it may be in brackets or parentheses or there may be a footnote regarding verses 9 through 20. Because you, you see, some Bibles don't include in here in the, in the book of Mark verses 9 through, 9 through 20. And there's a footnote and a bracket because of earlier manuscripts that do not include these verses. You see, the Bible is collected of many Bible manuscripts. We have thousands of manuscripts. And not all manuscripts include verses 9 through 20. So that's why, like in my Bible, I have a New King James and there's a footnote there beginning in verse 9 with a little 1. And then it says, they are lacking in codex, syntax and codex through the, all the other marks continued, let me see, through lacking in Codex Sinai and other Codex. And it just gives a description that these verses are not in every single manuscript. So some modern translation may just leave that part out of Mark and kind of leaving it ending in verse 8. And that's why I think that's an odd way to finish the gospel. After the resurrection, and go out and tell, and then it says in verse 8, And they went out quickly and fled, for they trembled and were amazed, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. The end. What kind of an ending is that? But I want to thank God, friends. We can thank God that the New Testament is the most attested document in the ancient world. We have thousands of documents that tell us about these texts of the New Testament. And part of the challenge that scholars have is that there are no two exact documents exactly the same. And that's why scholars compare manuscripts, earlier manuscripts, with older manuscripts. And I want to recommend, I really want to recommend, I have a book here that I read for a class called Origin and Development of the Bible. I'm not sure if they're still using this book, but it's called A General Introduction to the Bible by David Ewart. And I will, I will have it in the back if anybody wants to copy the name. Um, I highly recommend this book as far as learning on how the Bible was put together and why some versions include a verse or a different wording or may even omit a verse. And this clears up a lot of conspiracy that one version is better than any other one or one version is trying to put down another version. It has to deal with the manuscripts that the scholars and translators are using. And so I really w w encourage you to, to, to read that if you, if you are, are, are interested. So this, this is part of the challenge that scholars have whenever they, they are translating the Bible and looking into different manuscripts. There are several reasons why scholars believe that verses 9 through 20 are not the original of Mark. And, and some, so, some of these, you know, you may think, well, wait a minute. So then should, should I ignore verses 9 to 20? Is that not part of the Bible? Friends, God's word, all of it is inspired. And verses 9 through 20 can be found in, in other parts of, of, the, of the Gospels as well. And even in the writings of Mark. Why Mark probably ended with verse 8? Well, some scholars believe that some of the most of the most important early manuscript end in verse 8. So that's why something that they, that verses 9 through, through 20 don't belong there. There are two other endings. There is a shorter ending and a longer ending. If you have verses 9 through 20, it is a longer ending. That, that there are some manuscripts that have a shorter ending to the book of Mark. The longer ending is more ancient than the shorter ending but the longer ending style, according to scholars, is not typical to the writing of Mark. And there, there, these are scholars that spend time in, re, in looking at the original language and seeing how Mark writes and then noticing a difference maybe here in these verses as well. 
But these characteristics, now that we're going to read from verse 9 to 20, we can find them elsewhere in the Bible. So it is not, it, it is, it is not something that discredits the Bible. On the contrary, it just goes to show more on how the Bible is inspired, on how the Bible was put together by inspired men and women that wrote it in their own words. And so here it says in verse, in verse 9, Now when he rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast out seven demons. She went and told these, she went and told those who had been with him as they mourned and wept. And when they heard that, that he was alive and heard and had been seen by her, they did not believe. Notice that, okay? They did not believe. Verse 12, after that he appeared in another form to two of them as they walked and went into the country and they went and told it to the rest, but they did not believe them either. This, two story, this story that Jesus appeared to the two going down the country, does that sound familiar? Jesus on the road to Emmaus, okay? And that's what I'm saying, that these verses, can, these stories, accounts can be seen in other parts of the gospel. But they did not believe. And then verse 14, afterwards he appeared to the eleven as they sat at the table and he rebuked them for, for what? For their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they did not believe those who had seen him after he had risen. And then verse 15, And he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes. See, this is on his mind, because he was, he was displeased that they did not believe. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. But he who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will follow those who believe in my name. You will, they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents. And if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. Everything that is mentioned between 9 through 20 appears in one of the other gospel. There where Mary is Mary sees Jesus, we also see in the book of John where two people where Jesus catches up with two people to, on the road to Emmaus, we see that in the book of Luke. The Great Commission we see in the book of Matthew which we looked at last week. And then people not being harmed when doing missionary work. We also see that in the book of Acts. There with Paul, where he was bitten by a serpent. And we're going to get to the book of Acts later on this year. But you see, Mark is the shortest of all the Gospels. And Mark emphasizes on a man, on Jesus the man, as a man of action. As a man of action. While, while Matthew emphasizes or presents Jesus as a teacher, Mark emphasizes him as a man of action. And Mark records most of the miracles. And you may have read that Mark's most common word is immediately. And immediately he did this, or immediately they went here, or immediately this happened. And when you read verses 9 through 20, there is a constant theme, which is belief. Belief. There we saw it with beginning with verse 9. There that they appeared and they did not believe. And then those two men that met Jesus on the road to Emmaus, they went and told the rest in verse 13, but they didn't believe them either. And then Jesus was displeased. Mark's, emphasizes, em Mark's emphasis on miracle makes his purpose clear. To highlight the mighty power of God and believe in Him. And believe in Him. You see, while Matthew proves that Jesus is a Messiah based on the prophecies of the prophets, Mark proves that Jesus is a Messiah by the witness and by the divine power that Jesus has. And through the miracles that He performed as well. 
But if you notice, the duty is the same. There in verse 15, Mark 16, 15, and he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. The duty is the, the same. The commission is the same. As we, looked, as we looked at last week there in Matthew, Matthew's commission, God's commission through the book of Matthew, we, we find there, go therefore and make disciples and preaching to all the nations, tribes, and people. It is the duty of the church, every Christian, to tell the story of the good news of Jesus. You see, the exact same reason why in Mark is the exact same reason why it was in Matthew. Why were there to tell the great news of, of, of the gospel in the book of Matthew? Do you, do you remember? We looked at it last week. There was only one reason even why today we, you and I, share the Great Commission. And it's, it's, it's part of the, of the context of Matthew 28 and is part of the context in Mark 16. What's happening at the beginning of Mark 16? What happened? Jesus is what? Is risen. Jesus is risen. It's the exact same reason as in Matthew 28 because Jesus rose. Now they have something to tell. Now they have the great commission, the news, the great news that Jesus is resurrected from the dead. And because he is resurrected as he says he would, then you can trust everything else that he said and everything, everything else that he promised. And Mark 16, in the exact same way, it begins with the resurrection of Jesus. And because of the resurrection of Jesus, as we saw last week when we read that Paul wrote that if Jesus had not resurrected, our faith would be what? In vain. But praise the Lord, the tomb is empty. Amen. Praise the Lord, he is not here, but he is risen. And because he is risen, we do have a great, a great commission, a great story to tell, a great truth to tell. And that's why, that's why here it displeased Jesus. There when he says he rebuked their unbelief and hardness of heart. Because if they didn't really believe that Jesus resurrected, what will that do to the commission? It will weaken it. You know, they, if they kind of doubt the resurrection, they, 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 won't, they won't share it. They won't share it. Now, that's why today, and we're going we're, we're gonna to get to a couple of verses today, friends. Do we, do you and I, really believe that there was a man on earth named Jesus of Nazareth who walked, who healed, who was crucified on the cross, on a Roman cross, who was resurrected and is now in the heavenly sanctuary. Do you actually believe that? Yes. Amen. I hope you do, friends, because that is the, the actual truth. The Bible truth. And not just the Bible truth, friends. There are, there are, there are secular documents of a, of a man named Jesus who walked on earth and did many good things. And there... Today, many people would like to find a body. But praise the Lord, there is no body. Amen. Proving the fact that Jesus is not here. Physically. He is risen. And because He is risen, because He is risen, we have great news to share to the world. And if you notice, what are the signs there in Mark 16? Beginning with verse 17. The signs. There we see, and these are the, the signs will follow those who believe. Those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons, they will speak with new tongues, they will make, take up serpents, and if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. Casting out demons does do we need the power of God to cast out demons? How about to speak in a new tongue, in a different language? How about to not get hurt by snakes or poisonous things? Do we need the power of God to intervene in our bodies? Or healing the sick? 
All of these signs require the power of God. And that is what Mark emphasizes in his gospel. But you see, power only comes from belief. That's why it begins there. And these signs will follow those who believe. Those who believe. Only come from belief. And Matthew reminds us in, his, in, in the Great Commission that we saw there in Matthew last week, that Jesus didn't send them with before he gave them resources, right? Jesus there says, all authority, is, all authority is given to me, therefore go. And because we have access to Jesus and access to that authority and power, we go out. We don't go out on our, on our own. I hope we don't. But we go out on the authority and power of God. But Mark's commission here, knowing that all authority and power and, authority and, and power is given to Jesus and we have access to it, we need to believe that we have access and that there is power in Jesus Christ. John 3.16, the most common scripture, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever, what? Believes. Is belief important as far as your salvation? Yes. <laughs> without faith, without belief, there, you cannot be saved. He who believes should be saved. If you look in Genesis chapter 15, Genesis chapter 15, we see there the, the I'm, we're going, we're, we are going to look through just a couple of Bible verses regarding belief. This is what Jesus was displeased with those that did not believe that he resurrected. Here in Genesis chapter 15, we see the story of Abraham. Genesis 15, verse 6, the Bible says, And he believed, he, talking about Abraham, believed in the Lord, and he, God, accounted it to him for righteousness. For righteousness. Why was Abraham counted righteous before God? Because he believed. Was Abraham a spotless, perfect person? But he believed in God, and he believed what God said and the promises, and he stepped out in faith and belief in God. And it was counted for him righteous. In Hebrews chapter 11, if we look in Hebrews chapter 11, we see that belief is necessary even to please God. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, but who without faith, it is impossible to please him. Without faith, without believing in God, without having faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. We want to please the Lord, we must believe and have faith. When we pray and, and ask God to forgive us of our sins and we claim 1 John 1, 9, do you believe that he has cleaned you and cleaned you as white as snow and your sins are cast to the deeps of the sea and he does not remember those sins anymore? Do you really believe that? Amen. Friends, we got to have that belief that God keeps his word and his promises. James chapter 1 just turn right there to the next book of James chapter 1 verse 5 and 6 <clears throat> if any of you lack wisdom let him ask of God who gives it all who gives to all if any one of you lack wisdom let him ask of God who gives to all liberally and without reproach for it will be given to him but let him ask in faith with no doubting for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind how important is faith friends Romans chapter 10 just our last verse re regarding faith there are there are thousands hundreds of verses regarding faith and belief Romans chapter 10 verse 10 
without confession no confession no belief Romans chapter 10 verse 10 for with the heart one believes to righteousness and with the mouth confesses he and with the mouth confess confession is made to salvation for with the heart one believes to righteousness and with the mouth confession is made to salvation and that goes right along with what Jesus says in Matthew 15 verse 18 that what comes out of the mouth is what's in the heart it's what's in the heart I want to share with you a story but before I do I invite you to turn to Deuteronomy Deuteronomy chapter 11 this is one of my favorite Bible stories of belief and faith and as you're going to Deuteronomy chapter 11 I have I have this little card this little Volkswagen in my office there on a shelf because it, re it, re it, re it reminds me of a pastor in Mexico in the northern parts of the, of the state of Chihuahua who and I might have shared this story but I always love to share this story was on a mission trip to an evangelistic meetings and so as he was on his way to the mission trip to 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 the church to the to the village as as the speaker of the uh, as the pastor for this evangelistic meeting that were going to be about a month long or three weeks long he is driving a Volkswagen bug like this but instead of yellow it was white and this was his, his this was his his everyday vehicle and it had rained for weeks and weeks before and the bridge that he needed to cross over to get to the village was flooded the water had the water had covered the bridge there was no more bridge on the contrary there were officers and and safety uh, people there trying to prevent cars or people from going and getting hurt from the currents of the water from the currents of the water and now Deuteronomy chapter 11 okay Deuteronomy chapter 11 22 I'm gonna finish the story but I want you to read this Deuteronomy chapter 11 verse 22 here God is telling his people verse 22 for if you carefully keep all these commandments which I command you to do to love the Lord with your to love the Lord your God to walk in his ways and to hold fast to him that the Lord will drive out all those nations from before you and you will and you will dispossess greater and my and mightier nations than yourselves notice verse 24 every place on which the sole of your foot treads shall be yours friends that is a powerful promise can you imagine if we took that to to heart and belief every place where our foot stepped and we knocked at the door to share to give a Bible study to give a glow track every place if we were to claim this promise Lord every place on which our soul's foot it's ours it is for your kingdom what a powerful testimony we would have if we really believed in these promises of God friends God does not change God does not change and God is still a God who works miracles even today and so this pastor got caught right there the police told him you cannot go to 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 this city it's flooded you know this, this is the only bridge well there was another one but it was it was a long journey through it and so what he decided to do he knew he knew the promises of God and he knew that it was God's will for the, the evangelistic meetings to 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 be presented there and he had two options he could either go back home and call the church and say I'm sorry I can't be there uh, postpone them for another two months maybe but the town was ready and the Bible workers had done their work and he decided to step out in faith and so he backed up 
his little Volkswagen bug, it didn't make that sound. <laughs> and he drove it right past the, the cones there into the river. Just into the river. As he drove that car into the water, friends, he started to repeat Isaiah 53, verse 2. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you, and though the rivers, they shall not overflow you. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you, and through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. Lord, your promise says, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you, and through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. And we're repeating it over and over and over again. And the angel of the Lord guided that car without sinking across to the other side. Where it touched, where it touched the other part of that, of that bridge and continued. And the people on the other side saw it. The first thing they thought was, who is this crazy man with the Volkswagen bug in the water? But you see what it did. See, there was already people coming to the meetings. But what it did, praise the Lord, many people wanted to meet him and wanted to hear what he had to say in driving his Volkswagen into the, into the river. Do you think he had a testimony on the power of God he could use during his meetings? Yes. Absolutely, friends. By the grace and praise and power of God, many souls were brought to the kingdom that month in that village, in that town. Because he believed in the promises of God, friends. But at the same time, I do want to mention, this does not mean that we have the liberty, you know, to ask God anything. And, and if we believe, you know, God, I need a thousand dollars. Friends, Romans, Romans 10, 17 tells us, no, I'm sorry, Galatians 6 verse tells us that God cannot be mocked. We, we, don't, we don't tempt God in those types of things. God is not to be mocked. What you reap is what you sow. And a person who reaps spending time with God, devotion with God, daily communication with God, is going to sow the power of God working in his life or the power of God working in her life. Because Romans 10, 17 tells us that faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. How does more faith and belief, where, where does it come from? By spending time with God. Spending more time with God. And this pastor who drove into the, into the river, many thought he was a crazy man. But he had, he, his name is Pedro Rascón Bustillos, who was a man who had a daily this man would wake up in way before dawn three o'clock in the morning put on his regular clothes because he was going to go meet with meet with God in, in his devotion time he would spend an hour in prayer and studying the scriptures go back to bed around 4 15 go back to bed and every morning, he, then he'd wake up and continue. But every morning, during those dark and quiet hours, he would set his alarm and he'd wake up and spend an hour time with God every day. And of course, throughout the day as well, he's, he read the scriptures, shared the scriptures. But what the, the Bible there tells us, <clears throat> what you reap is what you sow. And he had reaped communication with God, a study of the word of God, time with God. God had become his best friend. That when he was presented there at the water, he prayed. I, only him and I, I'm sorry, only him and God know what they spoke about. But he trusted in the promises of God. And only because he had that communication with God, he must have felt comfortable in driving his car into the water. Someone like me, I probably would not have done it. Not because I lack communication, no, no, no. But every single one of us, friends, if we want to really share the gospel, we want to, to do this great commission, 
we want more belief in God, more faith in God, friends, we need to spend more time in God. There is no ways around it, friends. And listening to sermons, friends, is good, but it is not the same. It is not the same as you yourself digging into the Bible, into the Word of God yourself. And letting God speak to you through His Holy Word. Through His Holy Word. To believe, to have power, we need to know Jesus daily. You need to know Jesus daily. And that's why in the book of Acts, and I can't wait till we begin the book of Acts beginning in the month of February, we, we will probably be beginning as we spend this year emphasizing on evangelism in the book of Acts chapter 4 that's why when the disciples finally got the point and they finally believed after spending time with God Acts chapter 4 verse 13 there it says, And when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and, and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled and they realized that they had been with Jesus. What a testimony. Oh, that, that, oh how that can be said of us, that they see myself or they see Pastor Austin or, or they see my wife and, oh, I'm... You can, I can tell that she walks with Jesus, that he walks with Jesus. What a powerful testimony. In verse, in, in verse 14 says, And seeing the man who had been... Na I'm sorry. Yes. And seeing the man who had been healed, standing with them, they could say nothing against it. But when they had commanded them to go, as, out, to go aside out of the council they they conferred among themselves saying what shall we do to these men for indeed that a notable miracle has been done through them is evident to all who dwell in Jerusalem and we cannot deny it so so that it spread no further among the people let us severely threaten them that from now on they speak to no one in this name and they called them and commanded them not to speak at all or teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said to them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. See, friends, once you have a relationship with Jesus, you cannot... You cannot but share it. You can't do anything else but share it. You, you, can, you, can, you can testify of Jesus without being converted, without having Jesus in your heart. But you cannot be converted and have Jesus in your heart and not testify. Once you are filled and experienced with God, it will be here as Peter and John, for we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. Which we have seen and heard. So back to Mark chapter 16. Friends, Jesus was unpleased with the unbelief of his resurrection. And I just, I just hope and pray that if there is any unbelief in our heart, that we ask God to, re to remove it. That we ask God to make it clear and have spent more time in His Word and believe the Word of God. Because believing also leads to sharing. Also leads to part of the Great Commission. In Mark 16, verse 8, we read those verses there how it ends in verse 8. And they went out quickly and fled from the tomb, for they trembled and were amazed, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. You see, as I mentioned earlier, the most earlier 
manuscripts end here in verse 8. If it does end here, it is a strange ending. They run out and they don't tell anyone. If there is a real, you see, if this is the real ending, why would it end here, if this is the real ending? It, it is, as I mentioned, a symphony with no ending, and you're just waiting for the ending. If this is the real ending, friends, Mark is wanting us to know that you and I have to go out and share. You have and I have to have the ending. And I believe that Mark meant for you and I to go out. Nobody went out, but somebody has to go out and tell. And it, ha and it has to be me and you. Go and tell the story of Jesus. This is the ending. This, this ending here in Mark 16 verse 8 is a call to discipleship. It's a call to testify that there is a risen Savior, that there is a coming again, a returning Savior for you and for me. The story cannot end with no one sharing. It has to end with every single one of us telling. But we tell because we believe that Jesus is resurrected. Because we believe that he has worked in your life. You may not have a testimony as this pastor with the Volkswagen. And this is just one testimony. There are many testimonies that this pastor has. But every single one of us has a testimony on how God has healed you, has touched your life, has done something for you that you can share with others. Amen. How you can share with others that there is a God in, in heaven who does miracles, who does answer prayers. That they may get to know who God is and get to be part of his people and prepare for his soon coming. Will you be part, will you, or will you be that person that shares the good news of a risen Savior and a, and a returning Savior, friends? Amen. I hope that you will be, friends. I hope that you will be. Jesus tells us, go out and make disciples. Go out and make disciples. And I still encourage you to continue to memorizing that quote from Acts of the Apostles. The church is God's appointed agency for the salvation of men. It was organized for service and his mission is to carry the gospel to the world, friends. That is our mission. That is our mission. And I pray that every single one of us, it becomes our mission. The Great Commission is our mission. And last Sabbath, I made an appeal and almost everyone raised their hand when I invited for one family to bring one soul. Just one family a family to work together to bring one soul. And so I will be reminding you of that every week. And we'll be helping you and praying for you and Pastor Austin and I will be here to help you in any way we can. But most of all, what you need more than our help is to be committed to Jesus Christ. Because that is where the real source and power comes from. Amen? Amen? Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for your many blessings. Lord, we thank you especially because we know that although there may be different ideas of manuscripts and endings, you have commissioned us to go and share the great news of a risen Savior. But Lord, we don't want to end the story with hiding and not telling, but with telling everyone. That is part of our mission. And so please bless your people, not just here in Cleburne, but bless your church around the world. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.